Okay, Dan. Now we are on live uh, on YouTube. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, today we we have a, a lithium battery uh, now we are on live solution. And uh, today we have the our specialist Dan Miller with us. But please, Dan, can you introduce yourself? Good evening, good afternoon, good day, everyone. I'm Dan Miller. How are you all today? I hope you're doing well. <clears throat> we will uh, go ahead and get started. Are you hearing me fine, Hernan? Yes. Uh, my name is Hernan Dominguez. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing of Hazard Control Technology. I'm I came from Argentina. I worked in the company for many years. I'm for instructor number one in NFPA and safety engineer. Uh, and the idea of today is try to, with, with Dan, try to give this, this webinar and answer all your questions in any language that we can. Dan? <laughs> hey, we'll do our best. Yeah. Uh, yes. My name is Dan Miller. Uh, I have a long history in the in the fire service over 40 years. I'm a retired fire chief, a uh, longtime fire instructor, as well as a, a longtime electronics technical uh, uh, person. I've been involved in electronics for over 40 years as well. I have a degree in electronics and, and many years of field service. Um, today, we're hoping to present to you some uh, information that you can all uh use in your positions. Um, you know, we have many uh, firefighters and fire chiefs on with us, as well as many uh, engineers, um, fire protection designers, fire protection engineers, and uh, business owners and dec decision makers. And we're going to try and give you a, a brief overview of, of the lithium ion battery fire solution. It's very broad spectrum, applicable to uh, the things that we all do. So uh, if you could try to keep your microphones muted uh, until we get to the question and answer session, we appreciate that. But we do want you to make sure you ask questions and we don't want to pass by your questions. We don't want to forget about your questions or for you to either. So we, we would hope as the questions come up, you put those questions in chat. And then when we get to the question and answer segment, we will go ahead and go one by one through those questions. So again, welcome to everybody. Um, make sure uh, if you uh, make sure that you've registered for this presentation. If you do want a certificate uh, to go to you with your name and to the correct email, make sure we have your correct registration information. So a little bit about hazard control technology. It's been around since 1997 as hazard control technologies. Uh, we have, we're, our products are made here in the US, uh, our encapsulator agent, but we have a global distribution network. We help organizations all over the world prevent fire, protect themselves from fire and extinguish fires. Um, we are specialists in the control of modern day combustible hazards. We help uh, industry and, and really uh, society move forward with modern day threats. We have our production facility in Fayetteville, Georgia, uh, where we make all of our chemical products and that's where our headquarters is located. But we do help people all over the world as the video shows. Um, we are the inventors and sole manufacturers of a product called F500 encapsulator agent. And that encapsulator agent is what we're going to focus on today as a broad spectrum solution to lithium ion battery fires, as well as the other things that get involved once lithium batteries catch on fire. Um, uh, today, with our focus on lithium ion batteries and battery fires, we're gonna look at the different industries and society in general, how it's impacted by lithium ion batteries and the growth of lithium ion batteries within our society globally. 
and how it can help us uh, proceed towards a, a more uh, uh, carbon neutral future. And uh, although there are risks and hazards associated with moving towards that future, which we're all experiencing now, uh, we believe that we have a very broad spectrum and applicable solution that the nice thing about our solution is it's is it's water-based and it's in the systems that we already use as fire protection engineers, fire protection companies, and as firefighters as well, since it's in the water systems. So <clears throat> lithium-ion batteries, they are impacting us as uh, uh, culturally uh, around the globe from the things that we drive, the things that transport us around the larger cities, the micro mobility devices, the scooters, uh, 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 the chairs, the um, uh, EV cars. Uh, they're even in the airline industry now as well um, from the ground support equipment to eventually the, the airliners themselves. They're in all of our personal devices that we use, whether it's a tablet or a telephone or uh, maybe even a vape device. It's very widely used in uh, energy storage uh, now because uh, as we gain energy during the day and during the windy times of the day, we need a way to store that so we can use it during other times of the day. So battery energy storage systems are a big part of the grid now and a growing part. It's in the aerospace industry and it's definitely impacting the shipping industry as well. The shipping industry, not only as a cargo, but the, uh, the, the mobile equipment used in the shipping industry and material handling equipment and over the road trucks, uh, it's all developing towards lithium ion battery power. Um, and then we look back towards the left side of your screen as we're looking at all those different industries. We look at also the cradle to grave uh, life cycle of the battery. So from the time it's manufactured, shipped, put in the, in the uh, uh, user's device, whatever it may be, uh, abused by us people throughout its life cycle, charging it, undercharging it, uh, uh, dropping it, maybe uh, it's involved in collisions of different types. Uh, but in general, we abuse the systems that we have um, and we, we put them through their paces and then aging becomes a factor. Um, we haven't really seen uh, by and large and by volume what the aging uh, aspect of lithium ion batteries is going to be and how that's gonna look. And then we have the recycling side. So the, the the grave end of the batteries. We hope that they're recycled responsibly and get turned back into their um, uh, core materials and use it again in batteries. But a lot of them we're finding are being improperly disposed of, and then they call, cause recycling center fires. So we need a solution for that as well. When we look at the technology behind a lithium ion battery and the, and the reasons they're so popular is because they have a, a high energy energy density to uh, to their weight. So they provide us with a lot of energy in a small package. And uh, chemically speaking, you have an anode and a cathode with a separator in between and uh, a lithiated electrolyte uh, chemical in there to to uh, act as the uh, electrolyte or energy source inside of the battery. And then the, electro the electrons pass back and forth over the membrane as the battery charges and discharges. So the electrons are passing through that membrane and looking for basically an empty parking spot on the other side. As the battery charges, the anode actually gets more of the electrons on that side. And then as it discharges, it actually, they transfer from the anode or negative side, the electrons pass to the cathode or positive side through an external circuit, whether it be a traction motor in your EV or your bike, or uh, through a personal device like a tablet. So there's a huge demand for lithium ion batteries worldwide. Uh, every manufacturer of, of personal devices and mobility equipment 
is calling for more and more battery volume. The lithium ion batteries are found everywhere, appearing everywhere, and uh, we have to be aware of their life cycle and, and how they're being used. They contain a diverse uh, set of multi-class materials. There are several battery chemistries that are popular from uh, uh, lithium iron phosphate to nickel metal cobalt and some others. Um, but each one has a little bit different chemistry. And as they compose or go into thermal runaway, they have a different set of fire behaviors, toxic off gases, explosive off gases, et cetera, that we have to be worried about. And then they also contain a high level of energy. Anytime you have that possibility of energy transfer through a medium that wasn't meant for energy transfer, you have the possibility of fire and combustion. Um, <clears throat> so fires can start in several ways. We're going to try to keep this simple and not go diving too deep into the science here, but short circuiting, either internally between the layers of the battery, a cylindrical battery, for example, has layers in a jelly roll um, and that uh, the layers can get shorted out uh, by dendrites or other trauma to the battery. Um, but you can have an external short circuit as well, a short circuit in the in the loaded circuit on the battery or anything that con comes in contact with the battery that wasn't meant to during transport or use. Um, overcharging, it can either charge too rapidly, discharge too rapidly, or maybe the charging system fails or a battery management system fails and charges it to too high of a voltage and doesn't regulate it appropriately. And then you can have a fire because of that or thermal runaway. And then extreme temperatures are a problem as well. If the batteries are not able to dissipate the heat because of overcharging, maybe because it's too hot of a summer day and they're in direct sunlight or uh, maybe poorly designed, or they've been poorly modified or repaired by uh, something like a rogue repair shop of, of the electric uh, bikes, like is happening in some of the, the larger cities, that can be a problem as well. So there are a number of ways the batteries can fail, go into thermal runaway, start uh, an off-gassing situation that fills the air with toxins and or explosive gases, and then eventually a fire. So this incident occurred in Lakewood, New Jersey in 2023. What you're seeing here is the fire department's initial arrival. You see some firefighters on the ground. Um, we have a, uh, about three trucks involved at this point. Uh, it, caused, it was caused by batteries being shipped to a recycler in a box in one of the trucks. Uh, uh, somehow got mishandled and the batteries shorted out, went into thermal runaway and caught that truck on fire. It also caught the terminal on fire. It caught a few other trucks on fire as well. So it's not just lithium ion battery fires. When we have a lithium ion battery fire, it's all of the exposures as well. And there's every class of fire involved in a lithium ion battery fire. There's a lot of class A combustibles in that fire that you're looking at. There's uh, liquid flammables uh, probably involved in uh, several of those trucks. There's electrical charge both in the batteries and in the building. Uh, and then there's also combustible metals probably in the trucks themselves. So there's a possibility of every class of fire when you have a lithium ion battery fire, even though the lithium ion batteries themselves don't fall into a single class. So this fire ended up damaging the building significantly. Um, you can see just the quantity of smoke that comes off of these fires, obscures visibility, highly toxic. It uh, can obscure escape. Um, it takes an abundant amount of resources. Uh, one recent EV fire uh, in the uh, Chicago, Illinois area, uh, a single vehicle fire took uh, five, excuse me, six fire departments, five hours to extinguish and bring bring to a close. So it takes a number of resources that uh, uh, puts us into a bind in a lot of cases. <clears throat> 
Well, part of the reason for the difficulty of extinguishment of lithium ion batteries uh, is because plain water uh, is somewhat inefficient at cooling. It has large droplets. They have a high surface tension and a low boiling point. So they tend to beat up, bounce off, not soak in, not absorb a lot of heat before they turn to steam. And that inefficient cooling uh, is just not good enough cooling for the typical lithium ion battery fire. Um, you have possible reignition when you use plain water as every firefighter uh, on here will know and have experienced before uh, when plain water is used on, on many types of fires, you have a potential for reignition unless you do a really good job of overhaul and or you use a water additive. Um, and then <clears throat> Uh, you have a minimal reduction in the amount of toxins when plain water is used, either the vaporous airborne toxins and or the runoff toxins. So when you use a lot of water, you're also flushing a lot of toxins uh, out into the soil or down into the sewer system. You have a lot of runoff contamination from that. So the overall efficiency of water makes it not a very practical solution for lithium ion battery fires. If you're a fire department, it uh, takes and, and uses up a lot of your resources over a long period of time and becomes a, uh, a high risk, low frequency situation. And then if you're talking from a fire protection standpoint, it it's not very efficient in that manner either. Um, it, it just doesn't do a very effective job at controlling and putting out lithium ion battery fires and uh, uh, leads to a, a situation that is uh, very dangerous for any occupants of a building. Um, and we'll talk about a better way as we move forward here. So as we're looking at F500 uh, encapsulator agent as a solution to this problem, it's got a much better uh, uh pattern of heat reduction. So if you look at that water droplet in the center of your screen, the blue part is the outside skin of the water droplet, and you'll see that it's coated with something. It's coated with F500 molecules with the, with the hydrophilic head pointed in and the hydrophobic tails pointed out. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's called an amphipathic molecule. Um, inside, you'll see the there's a millions uh, in... Uh, reality, millions of spherical micelles, hundreds in this picture, but the spherical micelles have the F500 molecule inverted or pointed the other way with the tails in and the heads out. And that's because the tails fear water and the heads love water. But as these uh, modified water droplet is formed, the, the molecules that end up on the inside have trapped carbons and hydrocarbons and have blocked them away from oxidation or combustion. So it blocks that, that chemical reaction that occurs that results in combustion. So the nice thing about that is it does that on its way to the fire as well. So if we're spraying with a broken stream and it's passing through the atmosphere and the vapors on the way to the fire, it's grabbing those carbons and hydrocarbons and reducing that that combustible atmosphere as it then makes contact with the fuel itself. In the case of a liquid, it makes the uh, the liquids inert. In the case of uh, uh, a liquid electrolyte compound in a battery, it makes that electrolyte compound inert. The uh, It's got a surfactant quality as well. So it makes the droplets smaller, able to penetrate into the layers in between the battery cells and actually into the layers of the battery as they're decomposing and coming apart. It prevents reignition because once it interfaces with the flammable liquid electrolyte, it makes it inert and no longer flammable. It reduces toxins in the, in the off-gassing and in the runoff, which we'll talk about how that happens in a little bit. And the overall efficiency, it's much, much better. It's it's a very uniform coolant. It has a high molecular weight. It stays in contact with the fuel longer and doesn't turn to vapor as quickly. So it absorbs heat much more uniformly and much more effectively than plain water. 
but when every second counts, uh, a copious amount of water isn't enough. And, and that term copious amount comes from the NFPA Research Council as they were looking at EV fires. Uh, an answer that was uh, determined at the end of their uh, studies was that you need a copious amount of water. Well, that's not good enough. Copious is not an engineering term. It's not a reliable or consistent term, and it's not good enough. So that's where F500 uh, comes to play. So in this video, you're going to see the F500 molecules come together in a spherical micelle. This, the nonpolar tails are pointed inward. The polar heads are pointed outward. This is a, an F500 molecule. The polar head is the, the white end in this case. The nonpolar tails on the other end, that's called an amphipathic molecule. Um, as it's mixed into the water stream, you're going to see the F500 molecules dispersed throughout the water stream, form into spherical micelles inside of each droplet. The droplets then come out of the nozzle. They're capturing carbons and hydrocarbons on the way to the fire through the vapor space. And then as they make contact with actual liquid fuels, uh, in the case of a liquid electrolyte or a flammable liquid, they're actually inerting that product as well uh, and, and resulting in a, an inert uh, liquid rather than a flammable liquid. So you end up with, with the uh, F500 modified water droplet, as we call it, with the uh, uh, F500 uh, coating the outside of the water droplet and the spherical micelles on the inside, trapping or locking up those hydrocarbons. That would otherwise burn and it does that very very instantaneously um, which is the nice part of it and it does it on a broadband effect so uh, or a broad spectrum effect so it's not just applicable to a single fuel as some extinguishing agents are you look at a dry chemical abc extinguisher it's got a very limited set of effects on a very limited set of fuels and it doesn't cool very effectively you look at um uh, carbon dioxide extinguishers. It's a, it's a gas that inerts the vapor space, but it also doesn't cool effectively. If you look at a, at a class D extinguisher, it forms a crust over the surface of combustible metals to, to block oxygen, but that's the only thing it's applicable to. Uh, and even though lithium ion batteries burn very, very hot, they're not a combustible metals fire and they're not in a package that would allow for a combustible metals extinguisher to be effective. And then you look at some other uh, uh, extinguishers that have come on the market that, that claim success with lithium ion battery fires. Uh, if you look at a vermiculite uh, based extinguisher with the vermiculite slurry, it's only applicable to a very small package that can be completely coated by, by the vermiculite. And it's, and it's not applicable to any of the exposures that surround the lithium ion battery. So when it comes to something like a large EV, material handling equipment, uh, any type of mobile equipment, they're really not applicable to something that larger or in that type of a package. <clears throat> and they're not applicable to the exposures that are a part of that vehicle, like all the synthetics, the rubber tires, um, the, the liquid fuels, if it's in a collision with another vehicle, there's just uh, a myriad of fuels there. F500 is applicable to all of them. Some of the features that uh, we focus on when we're talking about uh, F500 is encapsulation itself. That's where we're trapping and locking up the carbons and hydrocarbons uh, in, in the liquids and also in the flammable vapors, and we're rendering them non-flammable and non-explosive as the agent is applied. Uh, in the case of lithium ion batteries, it's applied at 3% uh, concentration in the liquid. So that you have a, a solution that's 97% water, 3% F500, and is delivered by the same systems that we're used to delivering them through either a sprinkler system, a fire hose, fog nozzle, no special equipment involved. <clears throat> rapid heat reduction, 
For example, we can take a fire at 1200 degrees and reduce it to just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in a matter of seconds. We absorb heat at least six times more readily than plain water. Uh, F500 in some uh, fuels absorbs it 10 to 30 times more effectively than plain water. So it's absorbing heat much more readily than plain water. And part of the reason for that is, is those tails pointing out. And then the, the fact that the water droplet is packed with the spherical myocells, it absorbs heat into those spherical micelles very, very rapidly, very readily, and also very uniformly. Uh, if you studied the, the fire behavior effects of plain water um, or the use of water on fires, you'll know that water absorbs heat very inconsistently. It can be extremely hot and scalding uh, just uh, centimeters or inches away from other water that is not absorbing any heat at all and just runs off. So uh, that's where F500 excels. It absorbs heat very readily and uniformly as well. Um, and part of that's due to the, it's got a higher molecular weight than water, much higher. So it maintains persistent contact with the fuel while it absorbs that heat. And then it, it uh, vaporizes at a higher temperature as well. So it's absorbing more heat before it vaporizes. Another feature of um, uh, F500 is what we call free radical interruption. So anytime you have incomplete combustion, you have free radicals coming off of the fire. And those free radicals are atoms with an imbalance of electrons. Well, they're looking to restabilize. So they made up with other atoms and create a rainbow of compounds, which are toxic, carcinogenic, and explosive. So what the free radical interruption feature does is uh, due to the high molecular weight, it blocks that coalescence of free radicals so that you don't have the formation of soot, smoke, and uh, byproducts of combustion that would cause cancer. Um, and, and we have many studies that show this, uh, that this is occurring and that it's very consistent as well. So that benefits firefighters, it benefits victims as well. Um, so one of the big benefits of F500 that we've learned from especially some recent studies is that it helps maintain survivability and the ability for people to escape a fire. That's a very, very important feature. And one of the bigger overall benefits of F500 use is it's environmentally friendly uh, uh, benefits. Um, we're lowering the the impact of fires by reducing that uh, soot, smoke, and runoff contamination as F500 is implied. And uh, we're lowering the runoff contamination that can end up in, in drinking water, in natural bodies of water, and in the environment. So what this video shows, and I'll pause it here in a little bit, but this is a Chevy Bolt battery. And lithium ion battery, we're going to force it into thermal runaway. It's going to start off gassing. So one thing I want you to notice here, as I pause it, is some of these gases are heavier than air, and they're kind of hugging the ground. Some of the gases are lighter than air, and they're readily rising, the hydrogen uh, for example, methane, ethane, some of those are lighter than air uh, and they're going to rise. Other ones are going to hug the ground. The ones that hug the ground can obscure visibility and keep people from being able to escape a building, for example, where this fire is occurring. And then it also creates an explosive atmosphere near the ground. Now we're starting to see some flaming combustion. And you're going to notice the blowtorch effect of the flaming combustion. So you can think of, a lot, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of cylindrical small batteries inside of their small cells inside of this large battery that all, uh, all that energy has nowhere to go, but out of the available openings. So you get a blowtorch effect out of the available openings that can go 
up to a, you know a few meters and catch other exposures on fire. <clears throat> And it's cyclical as more and more cells catch on fire, go into thermal runaway. It's cyclical. It'll relax a little bit. You'll get more smoke and then you'll get more flames again. Now what you're going to see here after a minute, uh, you're going to see the, the battery enclosure itself start to get involved. Um, that being uh, uh, some kind of a compound that that's made out of it it tends to combust itself. You see the F500 is going to be used on this and the battery is going to go out very, very quickly. The smoke's going to disappear instantaneously. Uh, but there's another feature that we'll, we'll pause and, and talk about in just a second. What you're seeing there with the with the white vapor is F500 and water vapor. Um, and it's uh, encapsulating the, the airborne toxins and the combustible uh, smoke that's coming off of that battery. Hitting it from all angles there just to make sure he's getting it into the battery openings. Good practice. You're going to notice how, you know, this didn't take hours. This didn't take copious amounts of water. It didn't take hundreds of gallons. It didn't take thousands of gallons. It took way less than 100 gallons and there's not even very much on the ground. So uh, proof that uh, it doesn't take a lot of water or the solution uh, to put this out, and it doesn't create a lot of runoff. Anywhere where there's an opening in the battery enclosure, the F500 solution is gonna find its way in there get in between the cells and into the layers of the cells and actually interact with the electrolyte to stop the propagation of thermal runaway from cell to cell. We've been studying uh, the effects of F500 on lithium ion batteries for over 15 years, starting in 2008 with Bosch and had nothing but successful tests as long as the agent was a, applied appropriately and, and with, with good, uh, adequate quantity. Um, they go out, they go out quickly and they go out very consistently with a consistent amount of water and solution, the F500 solution. So if we look at <clears throat> the efficiency of F500 on lithium ion batteries, it's very consistent, very uniform, very successful, halting that cell to cell uh, propagation of thermal runaway. It reduces the explosivity by reducing and encapsulating those vaporous gases that come off of lithium ion batteries and that create a very dangerous hazardous atmosphere for occupants of a building or an automobile uh, or any situation like that um, and uh, reduce the chances of it growing into something larger. We look at uh, things like apartment buildings. They've had a big uh, problem in a lot of the larger cities. London and New York City come to mind immediately with micromobility devices being charged in individual apartments and they go, they catch on fire so quickly and, and consume a part of the apartment so quickly that it cuts off egress and kills people. So one of the benefits of F500, if it can be applied quickly um, and recognized quickly is that it, it really knocks down the, uh, the byproducts of combustion, the smoke, it improves visibility and helps people escape. 
<clears throat> Toxicity is another uh, another factor that F five hundred effectively uh, deal with deals with mitigates uh, and consumes by encapsulation things like hydrogen fluoride, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide are all some of the gases that come off of these things. And, and that's really a matter of uh, the state of charge, the chemical makeup of the battery, but they're all going to put out some uh, type of gases that result in toxicity and or flammability. And that's the thing that F500 really, really excels at when we encapsulate those gases and and then also simultaneously interact with the electrolyte, neutralize the electrolyte, and provide advanced cooling. This is at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. This is uh this is an e-bike battery, so not super large, um, but it shows you the power of the battery. Once it goes into thermal runaway, if you can imagine hundreds more or thousands of more cells in an EV or piece of material handling equipment, uh, ground support equipment in an airport, something like that, you've got a much bigger fire on your hands. I'll let the fire kind of develop here. When we get about to the one minute mark, it really starts to take off and you have the Simultaneous hazards of off-gassing, material ejection hazard, blowtorch effect flames. So imagine that being a much larger battery and the effect that would have on a facility, the inventory in your facility, life safety, the ability of workforce to escape or, or residents to escape, um, and then your ability to put it out. This is an F500 extinguisher being used, just one of our nine liter or two and a half gallon uh, pressurized F500 extinguishers. Puts it out in a matter of seconds, never to reignite again. So not only are we putting them out, we're putting them out consistently with a lot less overall solution than you would use if you were using plain water. And you'll notice the atmosphere was cleaned up immediately as well. <clears throat> so in this video, we're going to look at, excuse me, show the same video over again. Make sure we've moved on here. So in this video, we're going to look at uh, something specifically, and that's the heat absorption capability of F500. What I want you to do is focus on the little thermal imager up in their top right-hand corner as this car fire develops. This is not an EV, nothing special. But if we look at the thermal imager view in the top right corner, right now, if you look at the at the scale on the right hand side of the camera, you're going to see we're up in the 1200 degree Fahrenheit area with the top temperatures that are coming off of this. Once he starts applying F500 solution, which they're going to do through the window of this car, I want you to count with your fingers how many seconds it is before all of the color disappears off of the screen of the thermal imager. Well, all the color's gone, which means everything in that uh, image right now is less than 300 degrees in a matter of just a few seconds. Um, the water vapor or the F500 and water vapor you see coming off of that uh, vehicle is at a very comfortable temperature, like a, a warm shower and won't scald you, won't give you a steam burn like plain water would. And that's a testament to the uniform heat absorption capability of F500 as it's coming into contact with superheated objects, direct flame. It uh, 
uh, absorbs the heat very uniformly and very readily to the point where uh, the water vapor coming off of it is just a comfortable warm and not even a scalding steam. You'll also notice that the black smoke from the car fire is gone. So another thing before we move on, I want to point out is that we can focus on EVs. We can uh, focus on combustible metals, but we're really having to change the way we approach mobile equipment fires, whether it's a car, an over-the-road truck, material handling equipment, a farm tractor. We need to change the way we're approaching mobile equipment fires in the era of EVs. It's a different animal, and any vehicle that you get called to could be an EV, or it could be a hybrid. It could be a CNG vehicle like there was in Los Angeles a few weeks ago that injured the firefighter in that explosion. There can be a lot of combustible metals involved. The nice thing about F500, it's applicable to all of those situations as long as you're smart about it and you use the reach of your stream, you use a broken stream, you cool it down on approach, you put the safety ahead of the nozzle, you absorb all of that energy very, very quickly, uh, you uh, encapsulate the hydrocarbons out of uh, any of the fuels that are involved, and it makes a huge difference much, much more quickly, much safer, much more effective than plain water. Better, faster, safer. And you won't get called to an EV fire. You're just going to get called to a collision or a vehicle fire or a parking structure fire. You're not going to get called to an EV fire. And there will always be exposures involved. I think this is the same one over again. <clears throat> so... Uh, third party tested. It's been third party tested many, many times over uh, for years and years, at least 15 years, uh, starting with Bosch, but also done and commissioned testing by Johnson Controls through Kiwa. Uh, NIOSH uh, has done testing with it in mining equipment. We've had testing that was conducted at TU Clausel University, uh, Fraunhofer HHI uh, uh, in Germany. I, and many other places uh, from uh, all over the globe. Um, and it's gained wide recognition. Uh, most of the, the manufacturers of batteries and mobile equipment are using F500, at least somewhere in their operation. Um, so they've endorsed it by their purchase as well. So <clears throat> what you're going to see here is at the Heinrich Hertz Institute at Fraunhofer. So what we have here is a 196 cell individual battery, battery module, and there's 10 modules. So there's 1,960 cells overall, uh, forcing one of the modules into thermal runaway. They are separated by a metal box which is some passive fire protection, very important to the design as well of EV batteries, passive design so the heat doesn't transfer from module to module very readily. It's gonna go into thermal runaway. It's caused propagation to adjacent cells and then they go into thermal runaway. And then what you're going to see here shortly is uh, the F500 going on through two uh, small sprinkler heads. And that fire go out in seconds and stay out.
screen's going to go black here in a second, and that's the F500 going on. Wasn't a very well lit environment in this test module, so it just goes dark. But it, the test report shows that it it goes out, stays out. There's no reignition, as with all of our tests. So these are some of the manufacturers that have, have uh, bought F500 for, for use in their own facilities, factories, uh, development labs, et cetera. Um, uh, so although many of them can't endorse it for, for field use in their, in their uh, vehicle owner's manuals, for example, uh, because they don't want to get into that liability game, uh, they use it themselves in their own facilities. So how do we deliver F500? If you're a firefighter, you just deliver it through your fire hose, preferably with a fog nozzle. You don't need to have an air aspirating nozzle or anything special other than that. Um, or using the common tools. When it comes to a system to protect a parking structure, to retrofit or to build new or any facility, uh, we prefer to use something called the diamond doser. The diamond doser is a water-driven proportioner, and HCT is the sole distributor for diamond doser in the U.S., and then helps us deliver the agent directly through sprinkler risers anywhere within the facility or within the system, or we can zone it for individual areas. So the way the diamond doser works, if you see the picture there with the, with the pipe going through it, that's the water motor end. As water passes through there, it turns a water motor, spins a shaft. On the other end is a small piston pump, which proportions the agent into the sprinkler riser at whatever rate the water is flowing and spinning that pump. So it's a very precise uh, dosing of the F500 into the, into the sprinkler, and it does so over a very wide range of flows. You can get the fixed version of these, or we also have mobile versions, and we're soon to have them on trailers so that you can pass them, uh, pump through them into a fire department connection and put F500 in any building or structure. So this video shows uh, a system put together by Elatex, one of our partners uh, in Europe. And... Elatex has designed a system in Spain, in Madrid, for protection of their mass transportation system called EMT. And this shows a, a design concept that's part of that. And it shows a parking structure where a zone is protected by a diamond doser, an F500. You've got a car there uh, that's uh, going into thermal runaway. I'm going to pause it here for a second so we can talk a little bit about the test behind this. The test behind this was conducted in in a tunnel uh, that was configured to look and uh, be configured height-wise with the ceiling height, just like a parking structure. So what they had was three parking spots, similar to what we have in here, but we had a, a two vehicles and one open spot. The uh, vehicle that they put into Thermal Runaway was controlled within two minutes by the F500 once the deluge started, and they let the fire get going for a significant period of time before they, they set off the system. It controlled the fire and, and kept it to the vehicle of origin. There was just a, a tiny bit of uh, paint damage and a melted mirror on the car next to it, um, and that was only before the deluge system was set off. Uh, all of that damage occurred prior to the F500 uh, being dispensed onto the car. In the adjacent or empty space next to the car that was on fire, within two minutes, it was able to maintain a survivable escape route for the public, which was one of the objectives of the test, for the next 40 minutes. And that's where the, they, they ended the test because the fire was uh, suppressed, brought under control. It was not interfered with or used um, in any way uh, uh, by firefighters. They just let the system run and it did a very effective job. So that test now can be used uh, to apply to other parking situations. 
This has a very specific zone in this test for parking EV cars, uh, but you can also uh, apply a deluge in a different type of a, a pattern using electric sprinkler heads and detection uh, so that it could go off anywhere in a parking structure and set off a smaller defined area deluge. This is the diamond doser in operation. What you have here is a diamond doser with the concentrate tank. Um, very simple operation, very simple setup. Um, the detection uh, needs to be at least triple mode from, from what we're seeing. So you have smoke detection, uh, heat detection, and carbon monoxide detection. But in this uh, uh, setup that they're using in Spain, they also use infrared detection for flames. Uh, one of the things you need to be kind of concerned about, though, as you're looking at detection is you need to make sure that we're not only detecting fire. We need to make sure that we're detecting that vaporization and off-gassing as well so we can prevent explosion. And F500 will uh, quell that uh, the off-gassing and keep it below LEL, but it's the system has to be notified of it and then be dispensed on it for that to work. So they've got a defined area deluge uh, being dispensed onto the system here, uh, in, onto the cars uh, to keep both the gases down, to make the situation survivable throughout, and to control the car fire. <clears throat> so the diamond doser system has a lot of versatility, it can be sized to anything up from a, about a two and a half inch uh, pipe up to a, a 10 inch pipe and, and volumes thereof uh, and different percentages. So it's a very versatile uh, system. Uh, it's got uh, continuity as you uh, deplete the concentrate, it's easily to refilled. You can refill the concentrate tank and keep going. Um, it's consistent uh, since it's a gear driven operation. Uh, you've got a very consistent uh, curve throughout the delivery of the agent into the into the sprinkler system uh, and or even a uh, standpipe system. Uh, if you're talking about a parking structure or something like that where there's standpipes, it can be delivered into either system or both for the firefighters as well as for the automated sprinkler system. <clears throat> it's a very simple setup, not a lot of complication to it. Uh, if you've ever been around the, the bladder tanks, you'll know that they're somewhat complicated, finicky. Age plays a big factor in their in their viability. Uh, testing can be expensive because you got as you use the agent, you have to refill it and then clean up clean up the contamination afterwards, especially with uh, a foam agent. The nice thing about F five hundred, it it's environmentally friendly, so there's no cleanup. And with a diamond doser, you can route the uh, concentrate agent back into the concentrate tank while you're testing it. It doesn't need to go out the end. Highly efficient. <clears throat> um, a uh, couple different pressure ranges, though, as an example, uh, uh, with the different models from 29 PSI to 174 PSI, pretty broad range of operability or 29 up to 232 PSI. In a very wide range of operability, if water's flowing, agent is flowing, you don't have to worry about elevation loss and things like that. They're affordable um, <clears throat> because of the simplicity of the installation, uh, especially on your total cost of ownership or your return on investment. It's a lot uh, less expensive to own a diamond doser than it is a bladder tank and some other proportioning systems, no matter what agent you're proportioning. And if you're using F500, it's very environmentally friendly as well. Uh, F500 has no uh, no uh, RICRA reportable chemicals in it. It's fluorine-free, biodegradable, non-corrosive.
Who oh, we mentioned early on, NFPA 18A. NFPA 18A uh, is uh, a standard of uh, agents for fire control and vapor control, um, water additive agents. Um, it's a 2022 standard, so it's fairly recent. Uh, in that standard, there's a section called 7.7, .7, and that 7.7 .7 defines what an encapsulator agent really is. It, it separates it from those agents that might call themselves encapsulator agents, but are really just maybe a magic shell or sludge material. And a true encapsulator agent under NFP 18A consumes and encapsulates vapors and flammable liquids, and the section 7.7 .7 defines how those are tested. Uh, 18A agents also have rapid heat reduction and significant toxin reduction. And then if you look at Annex 4.3 of NFPA 18A, it specifically addresses uh, in the NFPA standards how effective encapsulator agents are at extinguishing lithium ion battery fires. And it's really the only place in the NFPA standards where uh, lithium ion batteries are, are dealt with other than in the electrical code and or in NFPA 855 where it deals with enclosures and battery energy storage systems and how resilient those are to fire. So <clears throat> as compared, compared to foam, foam's an NFPA 11. Again, it's got a, a, a pretty small... Uh, it's not a broad spectrum. It's a very narrow spectrum uh, agent. Uh, inert gases, uh, they are also, uh, and so all they do is inert the, the vaporous atmosphere. They don't cool, so they really are not applicable to lithium-ion batteries. Water, it's a mechanical coolant, uh, inefficient at heat reduction, and you're going to need copious amounts, which also means undefined amounts of water to put this out. <clears throat> so we are to the question and answer section. Um, let's let's take a look at chat and turn on yes, we, help with some of the questions. Yeah, I, I tried to answer some questions because we don't have enough time. But but yes, the first question is from might be Rob muted, Hunter, is my question will be regarding use of A five hundred lithium primary metal batteries. Has A500 ever been tested on those type of cells? Is it, I imagine since it can be used on magnesium and titanium fire, lithium metal could also be used, science. I'm trying to get to that question up here. I can read it as well as... Yes, in, he's in the okay, open. I, I see. It's from Rob Hooper? Yes. Okay. Um, very good. Good question. Um, uh, F500 has been tested on, on combustible metals, Class D fires extensively. It works very, very well. Uh, the coated and protected water droplet uh, makes it resist that uh, separation of hydrogen and ox oxygen that happened with plain water. All it does is, is it goes on and it cools. We've got a lot of information to share with you uh, on all the combustible metals. It's very successful at that. The other is, what happens when the battery is under the car and you can't get it to that easy? You comment about the test in Spain, Dan. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm trying to find uh, that question on here as well. Can you repeat that one more time, please? What happens when that battery is under the car and you can't get it that easy? Okay, very good. Very good question. So that specific scenario was, was tested in the uh, test by APLUS in Spain. Uh, for the Elatex system, and uh, it number one, we don't necessarily need direct impingement on the battery or the battery cells themselves to control the fire. First off, anywhere that flames are coming out, the agent can get in, 
and then in the uh, test in Spain, and not only the test in Spain, but also uh, in another incident that occurred in Germany and some other incidents around the world, uh, it's been demonstrated that F-500 is effective at controlling and suppressing fire, even when it uh, is put on the exterior of a battery enclosure. So although shielding does prevent present, you know, somewhat of a challenge to any agent, uh, 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 if F-500 is going on in general onto that vehicle, onto that battery enclosure or area, it's going to, it's going to do, uh, several things. First off, it's going to control the atmosphere. It's going to control the atmosphere to make it survivable and it's going to improve the visibility. You're going to, you're going to lower the lower explosive limit or the explosivity of the vapors in and surrounding that incident. And that's going to improve the overall environment. It, uh, in the case of the Spain test, it limited it to the vehicle of origin and didn't let it go beyond that. And as the test uh, proceeded, that fire just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It almost went completely out, uh, but it was very, very, well controlled within just two minutes and that control was maintained throughout the test which was over 40 minutes hey thank you we have other question from dennis colburn is if i can be in water base how does it not become electrified when existing and lithium battery fire um <clears throat> so first off um, when you're applying the agent, we're applying it with a broken stream. We have somewhat of a standoff distance, whether it's coming out of a sprinkler head or you're using a nozzle. Uh, we don't, we don't recommend that you use a smooth bore nozzle and, and just stick it into the battery. Um, so that standoff distance, however short, is going to protect you from feedback current to the nozzle. And we've demonstrated that uh, up to 345,000 volts actually in a test uh, with Con Edison in, in New York. Uh, and with a 25 foot standoff distance and a broken stream, uh, there was no significant return current to the nozzle. When it comes to EV fires, we're dealing with from somewhere in the ballpark of 400 volts on up to six to 800 volts. Uh, total potential, that's DC potential, which has a, a really a lot more kick to it than, than alternating current and can really uh, cause a lot of immediate damage, traumatic damage. But in no case, just like uh, with extrication, uh, are we promoting you to, to use a practice that would cause a complete circuit back to the user? So in order for a complete circuit back to the user, you have to have not only a current path through the water stream to the nozzle user, but you'd also have to have a ground return path from, from that person's boot or boots back into the vehicle chassis and back into the anode or the positive side of the battery, whichever one happened to be shorted to ground at that, at that moment. So those circumstances all coming together at one time I'm not saying it could never happen, but we're but we're training you with practices that you're going to cool down, neutralize this vehicle as you're approaching. We're not going to ever uh, put you in a situation that makes you susceptible to direct current shock. Okay. Uh, we have uh, the question of Akash the size. What is the application rate need to be considered for ICE versus EV fire. So as far as an application rate goes, um, so F500, if we're looking overall, all the different classes of fire with our ordinary combustibles, half to 1%. So your class A's, half to 1%. Anytime you have flammable liquids, combustible metals, or lithium ion batteries involved, we want you to bump it up to 3% so that you get good consistent results. 
But as far as an application rate goes, I prefer you use your normal everyday firefighting nozzles that you're normally using for car fires and structures. You're going to come out fine. Uh, you're going to overwhelm that fire in, in just a very few minutes um, and, and more than likely put it out. Um, might have to do a little bit of overhaul work, a little bit of uh, standing by with a thermal imager to make sure it got all the way out and it's not, and then it's no longer in thermal runaway. Um, and there are other tools out there as well. Uh, the, the EV blankets that they're, that a lot of places are selling are, I think, uh, a really good tool <laughs> post extinguishment to protect that vehicle and transport it. Just the action of dragging that vehicle up onto a roll off can cause it to go back into a thermal runaway because you could cause a, a, a short circuit again, a short circuit arc, send it back into thermal runaway. So always be ready for those types of situations. Um, that vehicle is not stable and extinguished until it's parked somewhere in an impound area and secure and unloaded and not moving anymore. Uh, at that point, if you've used F500, we've had very, uh, I don't think I know of any situation where we've had reignition, but uh, with plain water, it's happened quite a bit. And and that's just because of, you know, the high surface tension of water. It's just not getting in there to those, those tiny little spaces and interacting with the electrolyte. F500's interacting with any exposed electrolyte uh, as those batteries uh overheat and peel themselves apart uh, f500 gets in there and mixes with the electrolyte and and inerts them um but anyone that comes along with a metal object tool twist uh unloading the vehicle off the tow truck whatever could send it back into thermal runaway just by a short circuit the other question is from glenn stevig safe for human sponsor Vithin in vapors? So <clears throat> the vapors, uh, if I understand right, uh, are they safe for human exposure? Is that what the question is? Yes. I, I believe that is the, the question is if you uh, smell or breathe the, the vapor of the F500. In okay. this. So the, the F500 water vapor is safer to breathe than, than plain water vapor. Uh, plain water vapor, you're not doing it. There's no encapsulation ac action with F500. It's encapsulating. Uh, in most cases, we have a very survivable vapor that's coming off of those because it's encapsulated. All of those, those nasty compounds that happen when free radicals come off of incomplete combustion, um, the toxic soot and smoke and all that uh, are being encapsulated. But that would mean you would have to apply it in a perfect lab type of a setting and make sure you've got every every bit of the fire from different angles at, at the same time. In real life, um, uh, I would never recommend that you're in an environment where you could breathe those vapors, especially from a lithium ion battery fire, um, uh, without respiratory protection. Thank you. We have a... Rob Hooper uh, said, will if I had to work with a CAF self-contained system like a ski unit used in an air crash rescue units? The CAF we have okay. was original setup for 6% AFFF. Would you recommend any change in concentration? I say yes, but you can explain. <laughs> yeah, we... Um... Well, dealing with aircraft, you're dealing with flammable liquids and three-dimensional flammable liquids, liquids being sprayed, blown around by, you know, wind, et cetera, uh, leaking. Uh, so we recommend a 3% application. However, you can accomplish that. Um, CAFs can be used, although we're not trying to create bubbles. We're trying, when it comes to a flammable liquids application, we want it to go on with some kinetic energy, uh, we're not blanketing it. It's not foam. We're not trying to be gentle. We want an aggressive mix with that surface fuel. Uh, so we want it to go on with 
uh, a broken stream nozzle. So in a lot of cases, we just ask you to turn down the air, turn up the volume of, of the solution, apply it briskly uh, at 3% and the fire is gonna go out. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> I, I have a anonymous attendee that he didn't put the name. He says, thank you, I'm quite interested in this product for fixed fire suppression system. Uh, please contact us. You have the email of our company. Send your contact information or put your contact information in the chat that we can share with you all this information and you can contact with the, our local people that you're going to start to understand better how you can put in the fixed fire suppression system. Uh, mm -hmm. Team Chitten, then, sorry if I don't mention very well, Team. The, can you please tell me how long has the F-500 extinguisher been NFPA compliant? Okay. Um, in in Europe, uh, there are extinguishers that are compliant with EU standards. We we meet, uh, we meet. Uh, our agent is UL listed for A and B in the U.S. and Canada. Um, our extinguishers that we have here in the U.S. are are not UL listed as an assembly at this time, um, but. It, for the most case, the authorities having jurisdiction, knowing that it's for a special hazard, will allow it as long as you're not taking away any other type of fire protection or any other extinguishers. Especially when they know the, you know, ABC dry chem, for example, it won't put out a lithium ion battery fire, won't put out a metals fire. So they, they will allow it in those cases because they know it'll put it out. Okay, uh, thank you. You know, some people start to put question in the chat. We are answering all the questions here in the chat of question and answer. Five uh, credit. Here is a car batteries are in close in a closed box, and the fire starts inside that box. What kind of intervention should be we do if we cannot react? the neighborhood where the burning occurred. Okay, uh, I understand think I understand question? that question. Yeah, um, so basically you're gonna approach it like you approach every other car fire, but with 3% off 500, you're gonna have a greater effect at cooling and hopefully enough of a uh, cooling to where you can uh, knock it out of thermal runaway propagation. And uh, you are going to have to monitor it with a the thermal imager and make sure that you do. Um, eventually, however, and this will probably be the case in, in most EV car fires, unless the battery is almost dead, um, it's going to breach that container or auto breach. And that's going to be your opportunity to get agent on the inside. We've had several cases, however, where external cooling to the battery enclosure has been enough and it doesn't take a lot again in the nfpa research council uh, uh studies on vehicle fires it took less than 100 gallons per minute uh, of uh, consistent cooling on the battery enclosure uh, to keep it in check and i would say any type of uh, under vehicle nozzle or direct impingement on the battery, uh, as long as it's consistent, is going to bring it down to where you can call it under control, out of thermal runaway. If you keep an eye on it for 10, 15 minutes after that and it stays out of therm thermal runaway, haul it away. <laughs> and, and the same person, Precred, is there a method that can affect the interior of car battery packs? You mentioned how punch, we, I know that in USA, we don't recommend to punch the lithium batteries. You have different tools to punch, but we don't, we don't try to, to create a, a terminal runaway. And I would never say there's no situation where you might not end up having to do that to get it to go all the way out, because there's probably some situations where that, uh, could be a factor. Um, there are several piercing nozzles on the market 
that might be capable of that. Um, one company has about a, a very expensive tool that will allow you to do that, but it's a very limited circumstance where you would have to do that uh, to get it to go out permanently. And uh, I would I would stick to your your available tools to do that. Um, again, <clears throat> you're going to want to be somewhat cautious using dry gloves, good boots. You can't use the old cracked boots you've worn for 10 years and, and go up and play in the water with the electricity. It's, it's not going to turn out very well for you. So uh, just take as few chances as possible. Work as carefully as you can. Uh, but if you use uh, a product like F500 consistently uh, and you apply it, uh, uh, you apply it consistently over a period of time, you're going to you're going to get that battery out of thermal runaway in most cases without having to breach the battery. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I believe that you answered other question from Andres Nieves that he the answer of him is could you talk about the application technique? You comment about the different technique, especially yeah, um, I I would really recommend um you get your firefighters out of the mode of rushing up there and sticking their hands and arms and head in a vehicle that are on that's on fire. Use the reach of your stream, use a broken stream, use a directed fog, uh, stand back 25 feet to 50 feet, apply it, let it darken and cool, observe it with a thermal imager, attack it off the angles. You might have to attack it a little bit for more than one angle. Um, every vehicle fire from now on should be a two-line fire, not a one-line fire. Once you're bringing it under control with the primary line, you can bring in the secondary line with a, uh, if you determine that it's an electric vehicle at that point and you need to cool the battery, you can use an under uh, under car nozzle or a piercing nozzle or even a regular nozzle and slide it under the car, as long as you have consistent cooling on the battery module, uh, you're going to win that battle. Okay, wonderful. Okay, the last four question, Dan, that we don't have enough time, is that can we use A500 with a corrosion inhibitor in water? You shouldn't really need a corrosion inhibitor. Besides, uh, F500 it has a pH of 7.0. It's less than corrosive than most uh, municipal water supplies. Okay. Nath Nathaniel said, back to the needed application rate, if using a sprinkler system with F-800 solution, what is the recommended sprinkler application rate and duration? So in general, we would have you follow what either NFPA or your insurance company or factory mutual, for example, would recommend for a sprinkler density and not vary from that unless there has been specific full scale testing to show otherwise. So, for example, with parking structures, they recently went from a hazard class one to a hazard class two, follow that sprinkler density, but then put in the F500 and the fire is just going to go out faster. Okay. Uh, Paul Conca said, well, would the application and activation of system be the same for lithium-ion and lithium metal? Uh, yeah, uh, metals fire, we recommend 3% uh, battery fire. We recommend 3%. So the answer is yes. Okay, the last question. Uh, ABD fire extinguished Asian compared to A500 extinguisher. So ABD is a vermiculite slurry. So whatever container that comes in, that's all you get. Uh, if that can bury the object in a pile of vermiculite sludge, it could potentially put it out. But uh, from my knowledge of it, it's shown somewhat inconsistent results. And then you're limited to the package. Say this, uh, I don't know, Say this microphone was a, a device. I know it doesn't show up very well. Say you're trying to put out an object that's shaped like a basketball, but it's got a lithium ion battery in it. Can you bury it in the sludge that you have available? Yes or no? 
if you can't bury it and completely encapsulate it in this ledge you have available, it's going to fail. Um, with F500, you're putting it on like water. It, you know, it's just an additive, uh, a flavoring, if you would. And, but it's a very effective flavoring that uh, puts out lithium ion battery fires like nothing else on earth. Okay, thank you, Dan. This, is, this was the last question. I want to say thank you to everybody for your patience. We passed a few minutes, but we tried to answer all the questions. And Dan, please, you can say goodbye to every, every people. Uh, so long, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today or this evening or whatever time of day it is on your side of the globe. I really appreciate your time. And, and please reach out and contact us. You know, that's the only way we're going to get you the answers that you need. Okay. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.